Today we've got Neil McLaughlin, Microsoft MVP, Citrix CTA. He's also been running the UK WVD Community Group for the last 12, 18 months. He's going to be sharing with us his journey, his career, the highs, the lows, and some tips that you can take away to make sure that you don't come across some of those same mistakes and challenges. We'll touch on areas of industry to give his insight and his thoughts on what's changing and how it's impacting our customers and consumers. I hope you find this useful. Please like and subscribe. And even better, comment below. I want to hear from you. I want to see what I can do better to give more relevant content. On that note, let's hear what Neil has to say. Neil, thank you uh, for, for giving me some of your time. I know it's quite precious at the moment with all the things going on with work and life and things. But um, yep. I think that giving the wider community access to individuals like yourself around what you do in a role, what you're doing in your career, how you've got there, and then what your aspirations are and what the industry's changed and doing. I think that's really powerful for people to hear. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Um, can you just give us a, an intro into who you are, what you do, and um, what a day in the life of Neil looks like, please? Yeah, sure. No problem. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to come on. So yeah, my name is Neil McLaughlin. Um, I'm from Manchester in the UK. Um, my current role, I work as a modern devices technical architect. I focus mainly on Citrix and WVD deployments. Um, so I mainly work um, designing and implementing um, solutions for customers. So um, obviously we'll get sort of pre-sales in, then we'll do statements of work, and then we'll do a design. LODs, HLDs, and then we'll go across and sort of do implementations. So um, what does my day-to-day -day look like? Um, very different each day. <laughs> um, so I'm an early bird. Um, so normally I, I wake up around five o'clock in the morning most days. Um, normally I wake up, come downstairs, spend probably an hour or two, looking at the updating on the news, looking at the tech news, catching up on the industry stuff. Um, and then around half seven to nine, I'll probably spend with the family. Um, so that's one good thing which I've got out of COVID is sort of having that time with your family. Um, and then generally I'll start my normal working day around nine o'clock. So again, that varies a lot. Um, so it depends what customer I'm working on. So normally if I'm working with a customer, we'll basically be writing designs for that customer. Um, we'll be doing proof of concepts with the customer and doing sort of internal testing and validation. Um, test lots of different, it just varies so much. Um, and then, yeah, generally day finishes for me around, well, work day, um, finishes around 6 p.m. Um, then it's time for the family. Um, obviously, have dinner, have a chat and stuff. And then, depending on how much I've got on, probably a bit of community stuff, catching up again. Because um, you know, it's like these days, you things change so fast that you just sort of pop in and out of things. So, again, I'll spend probably an hour um, on Twitter or LinkedIn or something, just catching up um, with what's going on with the community stuff. Um, and then, time for bed. So, that's a normal average day in the life of me. Yeah, fun, fun packed days. And right, you, you run the WVD community in the UK, right? I do, yeah. Yep. So um set that up around April. Cool. Um, yeah, and it's just grown massively. So that does take up a lot of my time. Um yeah, probably yeah, releases every every hour of every day almost. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean it got to a stage last week. Yeah, uh, I think it was around two weeks ago where I was just like, oh my god, because we had the the Microsoft Meets event coming up, which is like we were presenting to over 2,000 people. Um, I had the WVD user group coming up, which again had to write the slides for that, write the content for that. Um, and then we had the weekend newsletters to produce. And on top of that, I had the sort of LLD to deliver for a customer and also do some work as well. So it's like, woof, but nah, it's worth it. So I don't mind. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. And so where? Uh... What, what kind of qualifications do you have? What accreditations? Yeah, so I've been doing um, exams since I, I passed my first exam in 1999. Um, it was a Microsoft NT4 workstation exam. Just like Simon, right? I had Simon Murdoch on CTO of Spinnaker the other day, and his, 
his first one was the NT4 Win 2000 MCSC tracks that he yep. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did my NC4 MCSC track um, as well, but yeah, long time ago, and I've not I've not stopped really because um, I used that as a, a kind of a baseline for my learning and knowledge. I find it is a good baseline. So yeah, what I've got at the moment. So mainly, um, I tend to focus on the skill set that I use. Um, so obviously, my my background's mostly Citrix and Microsoft Stack. So. I've got a Citrix certified expert in apps and desktops, um, certified professional in apps and desktops, and also I'm an AWS certified solution architect associate, um, and also a Microsoft certified Azure administration associate, and a Microsoft certified Azure solution expert, Azure solutions architect expert level. So they're the I ones think, I've um, got at the moment. I, I did the AWS professional one um about a year ago and it's probably one of the most hardest exams I've ever yeah had. yeah i tinkered around doing that but at the time i wasn't working around adus um so i thought mm, it's not gonna be much benefit to me um yeah. but the aws associate exam so originally i did all three of them and that was my sort of first proper dip of a toe into sort of cloud computing and i loved those exams um, the way they were laid out and the questions they asked you was so kind of realistic and stuff. And yeah, I really, really, really enjoy studying and um, for those exams. So if you uh, want to do any cloud exams, I think the AWS um, associate exams and the Azure exams are a really great start. Yeah, cool. And I think a nice segue from that, right? So where, where did your career start out? What were you doing and how has it progressed over, over the years? Yeah, well, I've been around for a while. <laughs> Um, I've been around for over, over 20 years. Um, and had to, when you asked me this question, I had to actually get my CV up in front of me because I've done <laughs> so much that I can't actually remember. Um, so, yeah, um, going back, my first job role was in January 1999, um, where I worked at a place called Phillips Semiconductors um, in Hazel Grove, a place called Stockport here in the UK. So, um, I went there to basically do a Windows NT4 rollout. So we were upgrading workstations from Windows 3.1 to NT4. So that was a lot of building them, putting them on the user's desk, installing software, hand-holding them kind of stuff. So that was my first real proper IT job. Um, and I loved it. I absolutely fell in love with working in IT when I went there and just really enjoyed for me at the time, it was, I can make a difference to someone's work day so easily. Uh, even, I know it sounds crazy, but even stuff like resetting someone's password, I used to love it. It's kind of like, well, I've just helped that person. <laughs> yeah, let's do the day job and stuff. Um, and yeah, when you did something good and you got, oh, thank you very much and stuff, it's just so worth, worth it. And then from there, I went to work for Shell um, doing N t4 server support um worldwide so that was quite interesting so i spent five years there so we went from nt4 obviously to windows 2000 when i was there as well so that was quite interesting because that was doing remote support for servers located all over the world so i learned a lot there um then i went to work for eds and um, working on the dwp account um, my job there was to maintain their test environment. So, again, I loved, loved, loved that job. Um, I was there for, I think, five years. Um, and essentially, that was, they came to us and says, right, we're going to be testing um, Exchange. Please, can you deploy an Exchange environment for us? Um, so you test that, install Exchange, make sure everything's working for them, and then hand it over to the, to the testers. And then the next week, you come in and say, please, can you set up a SQL cluster for us? So, um I got to learn a lot there because you were installing and configuring stuff day in, day out um, in a test environment. So um, obviously you could troubleshoot it to your heart's content. Um, I used to stay there till one, two o'clock in the morning sometimes, just troubleshooting stuff to get it working because I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, worked for there. And then I went to work for Cat Gemini where I was an infrastructure consultant on the HMRC Stride project, which was the largest project at the time. So that was migrating 110,000 users um, 
onto Windows XP. Um, so I would say worked in their uh, migration room where basically every morning they come in and look at the biggest issues of the previous night migrations, then go away and fix them. Um, so I was there for two years. So that was really, really high pressure job. Yeah. Um, and then I went to work for um, HP um, <laughs> as a global active directory support specialist. So at that time, I had a deep interest in active directory. Um, and then so that was basically doing a active directory for flying support globally for Unilever um, account. So that was, again, really interesting. Um, I thought I knew active directory before I went there. <laughs> um no i didn't know ad but when i left there i knew ad so yeah. um i went deep 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 like into days AD. and days and weeks in adsi edit oh yes AD, adsi edit i was using daily um using sort of ldp to look into the schemas and doing lots of really really advanced AD. and then from there um i went to work as my current role um which is obviously a citrix and wvd architect at new signature so that's my history quite long yes, pretty pretty well rounded though right it's like everything from delivery consultancy work support so mm -hmm. i think one of the things that i've been when i've been speaking to other other people over these sessions is that the people that have gone through that that breadth of um engagement should we say and, and experiences so like working the way up from first second third line doing a bit of project work internally then going into consultancy and then into pre-sales architecture design and whatever else i think from what i've seen and heard so far is everyone's kind of the most successful people that i've spoken to is, have kind of gone through that journey right and yep. learned the tools of their trade early on yeah and and been that guy on the phone right going how can i help that password reset okay how do i do mm -hmm. this how do we do that because i think those basics around understanding customer requirements whether it's internal or external customers is, is critical in in this day of age in, in technology and it because yep. everything is to provide a service to the end user and if you don't know what they want and how important it is to them then you're gonna absolutely you're gonna fail right yeah i mean previously obviously the it guys used to be the ones who were stuck in the back room and didn't speak to the to the customers yeah. right um the best it people i know are very as you said well-rounded they know how to speak to the customers. They know what the customers want. They, you can put them in front of a CTO or a director and they can speak to those people. They can understand their requirements. They, they know troubleshooting from the ground up and they know how to. I mean, the biggest thing I will say, I mean, when I first started in IT, um, I said to the guy who interviewed me, what, why, why me? Um, and he basically said, because it's your methodology. <laughs> to troubleshooting it's the way you when i interviewed you it's the way you think and i think that's for me it's the one thing which i've used from my whole career is the way i approach a problem or the way i approach a design or the way i approach a customer meeting or the way i approach a conversation and there's always a roadmap in my head and it's always start from the very simple stuff and work your way up yeah um the people who actually struggle the most who just dive in at the deep end um Nine times out of ten, the answer stare at your face if you start from A and work your way through to Z. Yeah. So that's my number one lesson for people. Just start with the very So when um we kind of covered off like what a day in a life looked like earlier, but if we think about future, so finish line, right? So obviously it's very hard to put a, a line in the sand and say, once I get there, there's gonna be a parade, everyone's gonna be singing and dancing and all that kind of stuff. But what what is your goal? What is your finish line? Where are you trying to get to? I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Honestly, I was, it goes. <laughs> I, was think, I was thinking about this before and at the moment, I don't know. Um, I think it's difficult because everything's changing so fast. Um, I do know that I want to stay technical. Um, I have been offered roles in the past where that would take me away from the technical side of things, as in, in for example, I got offered a role doing um, product marketing or I got offered the role doing pure design stuff. And if you turn around to me and says, I'm not going to let you near a console again for the next five years, it would kill me because I love that technical hands-on and doing it. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, I think I was in, I was in my role at Intrinsic. Um, I can't remember how long ago that was now off the top of my head, but um, I remember my manager at the time there when I was there, I was saying that I want to be, 
I want to be both. I want to be design and mm. delivery. I want to be pre-sales yeah. and delivery. I want to see design it and take it to fruition and deliver it. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember him saying to me, well, there's no sitting on the fence, Kyle. It's one or the other. Which one yeah. do you want? Yeah. And at that point, I kind of sat there and thought, wow, <laughs> yeah. how, how do I make this decision? Because yeah. one of them is either going to leave me in a specific position I may not want to be, or the one might put me into a role that I'm just not mm. going to like. And I'm going exactly. to waste time which yep. time is extremely precious. What, what made you get into the industry? I'm kind of getting a feel that it's, it's the tech, right? It's getting deep dive into something, fixing stuff and making. Yeah. It's, um, it's, well, I've been around computers for probably since I was eight years old. Um, I got my first computer, uh, which was BBC Micro. I think it was. Um, I'm going to have to get a picture of one of those and put that on screen now because no one's going to know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> and then I had the Anamshad CPC 464 um, and then I moved on to a, a proper computer. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just fell in love with making it do things um, and getting things to work. I mean, I remember spending hours and hours and hours hacking around within the config.sys files and autoset.bat um, messing around with command line switches to just to get one mega memory free so I could play a game. Um, but I would spend hours doing stuff like that. Um, I just loved it. Um, so, yeah, I just fell in love with it. And then I, I decided that's what I wanted to do as a career. Um, but then obviously I came to the hard decision, right? Well, because at the time, if you want to work in IT, you have to go and do a degree. And at the time, the only degree you could do was a computer science degree. Did you do the degree? No. No I, no, I think a lot of people I've spoken to kind of got to that point where they thought degree or just get real life experience. And I think yeah. most people I've spoken to so far just went for real life experience. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad that I did um, because it's worked out so well for me. Um, I didn't go for the degree because I hated, I was horrible at maths. I still am horrible at maths. Um, and I hated programming. I still do hate programming. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That's the two reasons why I didn't go. And yeah, it worked out probably more of the best decisions I made not to go ahead and do a degree. Yeah, no, that was the same. I, I took a year out between college and university to, to try and get a job and see what I could get and then yep. make a decision. Yeah. And I ended up not going for uni because I managed to get a job on a support desk, right? And for mm. me, I thought, well, I'm earning, I'm getting my foot in the door, I'm in a decent organization. Why would I throw that away to go into academia? Yeah. Um, looking back, I think I probably missed out on the experience, right, of university and making the friends and all those kind of mm. things. But for me, that that wasn't a priority at, the, at that time. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's your most memorable moment during your career? <sighs> There's many. Um, I think one of the most rewarding stuff that I did was if pro probably a project that we worked on a few years ago. Um, where I was working at a big building site here in the UK. Um, we had a, a very complicated project where we were involving lots of different offshore suppliers. Yeah. So you like IBM, TTS, Infosys, those, those kind of peoples. Um, and we essentially got told we had to migrate them onto our new Citrix platform, which was also on new hardware as well. Um, with no downtime. Okay. Um, and we were like, right, okay. Um, so we developed this way of doing it. Um, and we managed to do them all within like a month nice. with no downtime and um, to the users. Obviously, they had to switch to the VMs off to migrate them across, but um, there was no, no issues whatsoever. Um, and for me, that was so rewarding because we'd literally spent months and months planning this. Mm. It was different suppliers, a very difficult environment to work in. And we did the migrations and they went so seamlessly. It was untrue. And do you know that feeling when you walk into the office in the morning, when you've gone through a migra complicated migration yeah. and you think, I'm going to have a day from hell here. There's going to be this, there's going to be that, there's going to be P1s left, right, center. I remember sitting there with the project manager and, no phone calls, no, <laughs> no, no incident managers ringing us. He says, he just checked everything's okay. And then you look at the console and you can see like hundred users and a thousand users logged on. And he's like, no issues. No. So is, yeah. Is, is the uh, service desk number working? <laughs> is, is it working kind of thing? So yeah, that's probably um, 
one of the recent rewarding ones, I would say. Awesome. And to flip that on its head then, um, the biggest mistake you've made and the lesson you learned from it? Um, probably on the same project where we assumed that all those suppliers had made some network changes that we asked to make them, um, which would have made this project a whole complete failure. Um, but just randomly, I just decided to ask one of the local IT guys, by the way, you were asked to do this. Did you do it? And they came back and says, no. <laughs> and we were told that they'd all been sorted. Um, so then we had to go away and check um, all the other suppliers and also, they have not done their bit either. Um, so I think the the biggest lesson from that that I said was always never assume. Yeah. Mm. The small things matter. Oh, yeah. um, they do. So it may seem it may not seem something to you, but that one little small thing can basically just curveball the whole project. So I remember doing a VDI rollout. I'm not going to mention for who for because I don't think I'm allowed to, but. Um, a few years back and, and we were doing the migration um, and we're doing the actual, the engineers going out to desk, swapping out the PCs with thin clients and all that usual stuff and getting them into a, a Citrix ecosystem. Yeah. And there was one lady in an office and um, she obviously left on the Friday, came back on the Monday and we were all there floor walking. So it was, we could, we could handhold and do all that kind of nice stuff. But what we found was that, she used to have a picture of a family on the side of the tower PC that was on the desk. Yeah. And we basically just stuck it to the table because there wasn't a PC to put it on anymore. The thing client was too small. Yeah. And forever in that moment, her life was over. Whatever the solution wasn't good enough, it wasn't fast enough, it didn't do this, it didn't do that. But when they were looking at the analytics and things and like log on times were 10 times faster, the application yeah. performance was five times faster. And we're like, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong here. It's got to be something else. And we found out basically that she was just upset that we'd touched that picture of her really? family and moved it and stuff. Yeah. Like in the end, I think one of the project managers went out and bought a frame from a local store so she could have it on her desk. And then she was the biggest advocate of the project. Yeah. And yeah. It, was, it was crazy. Those little things that, that, that people they hold do. on to. That, yeah. that we've, in a lot of circumstances, if you weren't there physically to see it, mm. it would have just been blown out of proportion and you'd have been spent weeks and weeks looking into technical yeah. requirements that weren't actually a problem. Yeah. Okay, so sacrifices so a few people i spoke to um when building their career and going through the mm. motions they, they, they've sacrificed Did you say mm. you've sacrificed anything along the way yeah definitely um especially during early in my career um there was probably a stage um where i was working constantly <laughs> um weekends evenings you name it so yeah i have, I have sacrificed a lot of family time I would say I'd probably say I have sacrificed a lot of personal lifetime as well because um especially when I was traveling mm. I used to travel a lot and you know what it's like when you're traveling your whole week is just basically consumed um through work and also weekends as well um, because at that time I had to be at customer sites on Mondays on Monday mornings at 9 a.m and I lived in up north and the customers down south so I did that for five years um, yeah. and I lost pretty much my half my weekend um, because to be at customer site on Monday morning you have to get your stuff ready on a Sunday evening and get in the car and drive down so yeah that period of my life um, I was pretty much 100% work focus um, and it probably did affect it did affect my personal life because I didn't see my friends as much um, mm -hmm. I didn't see my family as much um, and also over the years as well, I've sacrificed a lot of time wise to study for exams and all of that stuff because it does take up a lot of your personal time. Yeah, but I think it's fair, people, fair to say though, right? If you, if you hadn't have sacrificed those things, you probably wouldn't have got to where you are today. No, right? no, definitely not. No, it's, it's worked to me in my head. It's worth it because um, you need to do that if you want to progress. But each their own. No, I mean the only thing I will mention is COVID nineteen has massively helped with that balance. Because the time that I used to have to spend traveling and I spend with my family and doing this stuff, um, which has meant that that sacrifice doesn't need to be there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I'm, I'm the same, right? So I 
traveling all over the country, if not around the world for me, um, seeing yeah. customers, helping out designs and so on and so forth, conferences, speaking events, whatever it might be. And um, yeah, probably three or four nights a week away from home. Yeah. And I've got a small child. Um, mm. It does take an impact. It does have an impact, right? And yes. since yeah. this COVID impact has come on to everybody, um, <laughs> middle of nowhere um i now spend more time with my family i get the chance to do the bedtime mm. routines to have tea together and all those kind of things take the dog for a walk at lunch all that kind of stuff and i think it's great and i think if it, the positive thing out of this, this this whole pandemic for me is that if more organizations can take this approach to work-life balance mm. further yep. you know allow people to have the option to work from home because i'm a true believer that there needs to be an office still for people some people can't work from home they need the social mm -hmm. interaction and yep. for mental well-being and all those kind of things um mm. And even myself, right, I, I can work from home. I've got a nice office. I've got all the equipment I need. But I still personally, if I didn't, probably, probably like um, last question on, on career, top three tips um, if someone was looking to start on the tech industry. Yeah. Um, so I think the most important one for me is find something which you, you're passionate about. Um, this industry is, it can consume you. Um, you need, if you want to be good, you need to be prepared to put the time in and to do that, you need to be passionate about that. Tip number two is once you've found all, once you've found that passion of what you want to do, as in whether it's networking, programming, DevOps or whatever, um, just go all in. And I think top tip number three is probably get involved with the community. Um, a lot of my career success has only come within the past few years. Um, because I've been involved with the Citrix CTA community and an and MVP as well. So um, what got me there was getting involved with the community. So be active on Twitter, set up a blog if you want to, um, set up a YouTube channel. Um, you don't have to be an expert to start. Just write out what you're learning as you go. We, we take an impact on, on today, right? So pandemic. Um, obviously, that's had an impact on, on everybody. Uh, positively and negatively in some cases um what, what's your views on 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 this panel what obviously we touched on um the way that it's made a better work-life balance for people and more things for family but what, what, what do you see how, how do you see it coming out the back of this or what would you like to see so it's forced organizations to think about the way they work um to me i think it's a good thing um because i think organizations were very much stuck in in the dark ages um even a few months ago, um, I left the company because I was told we're not set up for, for remote working. Um, if you must down the line, they've got 16,000 users remote working. Um, it's forced companies into thinking, rethinking how they work. So coming out of it, it is going to be interesting to see how companies respond. Um, personally, I think it's going to be a 50-50. Some companies will let you continue to work. I mean, we've heard lots of stories in the news, right, about big companies who have shut down their offices completely. They don't want to go back because they said, oh, we can save a million pounds a year. Why, why, why are we having these offices? Why are people coming into work to the offices? Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, so no, in the local gov sector, so councils and things in the UK, yeah, yeah, yeah. they've yeah. always been the massive real estate consolidation push and yeah. this, I think this is just going to force that now to accelerate because they were planning on doing this anyway. And what this is just proven to them is they can, they can do it now. They don't Absolutely. Have to play. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I'll hold it there for a second. Hold it there for a second. All right. Uh, sweltering because I've left the heater on. Okay. <laughs> and absolutely roasting. I can hear it crackling in the background and I'm thinking, oh. And start a fire. Yeah, start a fire or I'm going to melt one or the other. Um, okay, so where were we? Okay, fi final one then. So is there anything that's got you to a point in your career where you thought, do you know what? I'm done. And then you've overcome it. Uh, how, what, what was it that, that got you to that point? And then how did you overcome it personally? Yeah, so I had this last year, actually, um, where I've got to a stage everything was just getting very complicated and business-like. Um, I was involved where 
my whole day was just basically sat in pointless meetings and doing lots of governance and reviewing designs and stuff. And I was just sat there thinking, I don't want to do this. Um, and I think a lot, you can probably relate to this as well. Um, sometimes when you work in enterprise IT, it can be a very complicated beast. Um, when you've got multiple service providers involved and even simple decisions and simple tasks can take months. Um, and I got to that stage where I'm thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> um, so to get over it, I, I went back to basics. Um, that's why I went to work for a, a much smaller company um, where there was only a couple of hundred employees. So instead of working on projects involving tens of thousands and users, um, I went back to working for projects that involved between a thousand and well, probably between a hundred and two thousand users. Um, because I missed that personal connection feeling of doing a project and making a real difference. So obviously we know that WVD is taking your interest at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether that's WVD as an underlay with, with Citrix on top as an example, running in cloud services as part of your role. So we probably won't go too much detail on that area, but what, what's an area of, of technology you think that organizations are, are not, not necessarily putting their money into, not developing and they're undervaluing it? Um, monitoring. Um, most projects that I do, they put a lot of focus on the requirements, um, implementation, then making sure that everything's working, and then then things just get left. Um, people put in the basic monitoring, are the services running, can you ping these servers, all that kind of stuff, but what is actually going on underneath? Um, that's what tends to get left out. Um, so if you kind of think about what Control Up do, where they have a sort of overall health dashboard, um, now, every time you mention that to a customer, they just turn around and say, well, it's too expensive. Um, but when you show them what it can do, that's when they change their mind because they see the power of what something can do. Because the way I always like to think about what a, mo a proper monitoring solution should be like, is you should know what's going on before the customer knows. Okay, so lightning round. Last technology purchase and why? The last technology purchase was my, actual, my new home computer. And who's your biggest inspiration? So my biggest inspiration is actually a guy called um, Nick Jugovic. Nick Vukovic is a guy with no arms and legs. Um, and he just achieved so much out of his life. And when I look at him, I think, well, if he can do that, then we can do anything, basically. Okay. Uh, what does work-life work, work -life balance look like for you? Um, being able to be around my family and not having to say no to them. What did you want to do when you finished school? Work with computers. <laughs> Same as today. Uh, what's your favourite book? A book called The Compound Effect. Um, I read it two years ago, and I don't know why, but it's just stuck with me. Um, it's a book around every decision that you make in your life as a, and it affects your future. Okay. And most important thing to you? My family. Answer everyone gives. <laughs> yeah, everyone's too afraid to say else. Exactly. If my wife found out, she'd kill me. Yes. Uh, fill in the blank. The new normal is? Remote working. Good answer. Must watch TV show? Ah, Casualty. Really? Yeah, it's my favourite TV show. I don't know why. Like I've, I've just watched it since I've been a kid, so. Oh, ah, right, cool. I was never expecting that. <laughs> favourite junk food? Um, McDonald's Big Mac meal. Oh, awesome. Well, I think on that Big Mac meal note, we can probably call that a day. So again, yep. thank you very much for your time, Neil. It's been no great worries. hearing about your career and where you've got to. Um, if you can send me the details on the WVD community, I'll get that put into the into the YouTube channel and some links onto here so people can come and sign up as well to listen into your podcasts and things. That'd be fantastic. Yep. Okay, will do. Thank you very much for having me.